and welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Writers Toolshed. I'm your host, Richie Billing, and today's episode is a little bit different to what we've done in the, the last few episodes, in that it is shorter. In fact, it's half the length of a standard episode. And the reason why I've decided to do this is because of a little bit of feedback I've received from you wonderful listeners, but also because I've been studying a lot of the data and the statistics from the, the first few episodes. And as a digital marketer, I'm, I'm one of them people who tend to analyze things and importantly, act upon them. And what I've come to learn is that shorter episodes seem to be preferred. So for the next few episodes, at least, each episode is going to be about 20 to 30 minutes long. And today I'm pleased to welcome back Aidan Mattis to the Toolshed for a discussion about weapons in the fantasy genre and a bit about their medieval origins as well to give you some ideas for creating your own murderous devices for your stories. Before we dive in, I'd be ever so grateful if you subscribed or followed the show. If you have a moment to spare, a review would mean an awful lot as well. And a massive thank you to everyone who's left us a rating on the Spotify mobile app. Um, I think we've had about 25 so far and yeah, all good, which is what I like to say. Thank you so much for to everyone who's taken the time to do that. Also, if you know of anyone who may enjoy the show, writing friends, people in your writing group or anyone you know who's flirting with the idea of, of giving writing a go, please share it with them because you never know, they might find it useful. And don't forget, if you want to take your learning beyond this podcast, check out our Patreon page. You can find writing classes and workshops all focused on fantasy. Um, you can also get a copy of my book, A Fantasy Writer's Handbook. Just click the link in the description to learn more. And lastly, if you want to connect with fellow writers to discuss ideas and read each other's work, which is for me one of the, the best ways to improve your skills, why not join our writing group? We're on Facebook and we're on Discord and it's one of the best places to meet like-minded people who want to improve as well and the best way we do that is by helping each other so if you'd like to network and connect with other authors just click the link in the description now on with the show and we're drawing our swords and readying our spears as we charge headfirst into weapons in fantasy i was keen to cover the bladed weapon because we see throughout the fantasy genre like in TV, films, books and games, a bizarre crop of, of weapons, swords, axes. You can just pretty much just an endless stream of just bizarre weapons, which always leads to the question, are these sort of realistic? Are they going to be even possible to use? But after all, it's fantasy genre. I mean, one of my favorite games is Final Fantasy, which had the, one of the biggest swords you'll ever see. And although at the end of the day, it, it's fantasy. We can get away with it. It does feel a little bit cheap if we don't explain things or if we explain things in an unsatisfying way. Because the reality is weapons like swords and axes are pretty heavy. So swinging around one for hours on end, fighting for your life, it's going to be tough and tiring. So. I was keen to get our resident debunker of medieval myths back in to the tool shed. <laughs> Mr. Aiden Mattis, how are you doing? What can you tell good, us about the bladed weapons? Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks thanks for having me back on. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, the, the biggest Hollywood misconception here is that, uh, first of all, that everybody had a sword um, in the Middle Ages, which at no point was that the case. It was actually definitely the minority weapon and not even all knights used swords a lot of them used uh great axes or uh maces you know, uh, other other weapons especially because if you're fighting from horseback you can really get some momentum behind something and it's much better to use a blunt force object like a like a mace or a hammer than it is to use a sword which is more likely to glance off so and, and of course you got to remember that this was uh the elite soldiers of the time like knights would have been kind of form fitting their equipment to the battle they were going into. So if you're going to be going up against, if it were, say, the English against the French, uh, knights would probably be arming themselves with hammers, maces, axes, because those are going to be better suited to penetrating plate or chainmail armor. Uh, whereas if you're talking about, you know, going and crushing some peasant rebellion, you're probably going to be using something quicker, like a sword that's not going to have trouble cutting through somebody's clothing. Um, but yeah, the uh, the 
idea that everybody had swords is definitely a myth. And another major myth coming uh, out of Hollywood generally is the idea that there are these just hours long battles in uh, the medieval period. You did have battles that were hours long during um, the, the classical era. You also had battles that were hours long during the, uh, the enlightenment era up through the early modern period where you basically had, you know, much, much, not lighter weapons, but weapons that didn't require quite as much force to use. For example, the Romans using the gladius, it was a stabbing weapon. Uh, and you really could sit behind that testudo and just stab out for hours on end. And it did happen occasionally. Uh, same thing with the Enlightenment era and the gunpowder age. You could have two armies standing across from each other firing volleys for hours on end because it just, that's how things worked. And especially when you worked artillery into it, if you included artillery barrages as part of the battle. And of course, there's the, the what really is the structure of a battle in the Middle Ages is you've got the, you know, the war as a whole, and then a battle could take place over the course of days with skirmishes mixed in. The skirmish was the actual fighting that was going on. The battle was more the encompassment of those skirmishes surrounding a specific event, a specific siege, a specific location. So uh, the Battle of Hastings, for example, was actually three skirmishes that took place over the course of a day. Uh, and Little known fact, the Normans very nearly lost, and when they did win the battle, the English were backed up against a cliffside that they were at the top of the cliff. So the Normans, when they went to charge their cavalry down on the English, actually a lot of their horsemen went over the cliff and died. So the English kind of got the last laugh in that one. The Anglo-Saxons did. Um, <laughs> but yeah, these these hours-long battles are, are mostly fiction because... It, even if you're a, a trained knight, you know, trained from the age of seven to fight with a sword and shield, you're you're still only able to swing that for so long. And of course, in the you got to remember that 1066 is kind of the point at which we switch over to mounted cavalry as the primary uh, weapon. The mounted knight becomes the dominant force on the battlefield after the Battle of Hastings. Prior to the Battle of Hastings, it was actually much more focused on infantry combat and the shield wall. So the idea of knights on horseback is definitely a high medieval and late medieval concept, whereas the shield wall that you remember from late antiquity up through the Viking Age, if you watch Vikings, if you watch The Last Kingdom, the way that they go into battle and the way that they square off against each other, that was what was much more common. And it was only after chainmail became this very uh, common form of armor that you had the the knight on horseback, because until you got the 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 mail, the word is escaping me, but until you had mail that went all the way from your head down to your toes, and in fact, for knights on horseback, it actually extend a little bit further than their feet. Until you got that, it was very easy to kill somebody on horseback. So horseback was horse horse soldiers were mainly skirmishers yeah. um, who would go into battle with light armor, some javelins, and a sword, uh, and then kind of be a, a force to counter the opposite sides, archers and javelineers. So yeah. the bladed weapon, the the sword, and to an extent the axe, but the the power behind an axe was not its blade; it was the weight. It was the way that you would swing it. So the bladed weapon, the sword, was probably the least common weapon used, uh, the least common bladed weapon used. Axes were far more common. And what everyone was armed with in the medieval period was a spear. Everyone had a spear. Um, your your frontline infantry had spears. Your uh, peasants had spears. Because a spear is very easy to make by comparison to a sword or an axe or a hammer. Because you can even just, you can stick any piece of metal on the end of a stick, sharpen it, and you've got a spear. And it's yeah. going to work. It's going to be all you need. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons that the Scots were able to resist the English so well was because the English insisted on fighting the Scots on horseback because mounted knights were just better. They were, they were from a social standpoint, a mounted knight was higher than somebody who fought on foot. So the Scots simply were like, all right, we're going to just fashion pikes. And it was very easy because you didn't need to, you didn't need to pierce the armor of the, the mounted knight to kill him. Yeah, You just needed to pierce the flesh of the horse and then the knight's on the ground. And then the people who are standing around with axes can just hack at him. And that's why, you know, it, weapons like swords became less and less useful as time went on. And you have, what you see is the sword goes from being like a gladius, a primarily stabbing weapon, to a long sword, a primarily slashing weapon, and then back to a primarily stabbing weapon because it no longer makes sense to slash at somebody wearing a steel plate. 
you're not going to get through. It's not going to do anything to them. Yeah. But if you can get a little rapier through the chink in the armor, then you're going to do some damage. So that's kind of the evolution of swords. That does not mean that sword play was not very important in the Middle Ages, and the people who were using swords as their primary weapon were terrifyingly good with them. But they are not nearly as common as we kind of think they are. Also, the, the kind of golden age of the sword, you might say, would probably have been around 800 to 1200, because that's the period during which you can still stab somebody with a sword. Um, so in the 800s and the 900s during the Viking Age, what you would have at the beginning of battles was champions on both sides would step forward and challenge somebody from the other side to come forth. This was an opportunity for younger, unproven, untested warriors to show their skill, uh, as well as sometimes there would be battles where a champion from each side went up and one guy died, one guy lived, and the battle was over and nobody fought. But you know, over over time, that changes a lot, depending on really the armor aspect of things. And uh, and the one other thing that I guess is related directly to this is the misconception that medieval battles had huge casualty counts. Very rarely did a large percentage of an army die, even a significant minority of the army. Uh, we see battles from the Vikings fighting the Irish where you had less than 50 casualties. And that was common. I think it was Magrath but I might be wrong about that. It's one of the battles between the Scots and the Irish, or not the Scots and the Irish, the Irish and the Vikings, where you have a field that is just littered with the corpses of men and horses, and there's armor and weapons everywhere. This is also how we figured out that the, the Irish and the Vikings even used cavalry, was because we didn't really have any evidence of it. It wasn't very common, but we found these horse skeletons at a battlefield, and a lot of them, and we were like, oh, they actually did use cavalry. And that was like the moment when it really clicked for everybody. They were like, oh, okay, there's maybe we were wrong about the way these people fought their battles. But no, you would, that battle specifically was uh, very rare because of the high casualty count. That's, that's not usual. Uh, similarly, the Battle of Clontarf had a rather high casualty count. The Battle of Hastings had a rather high casualty count. So a lot of the, the famous battles you hear about are the ones where a lot of people did die. Agincourt, Poitiers, Quessy. In, in the Hundred Years' War, but the for the most part, medieval battles saw, you know, 10, 15 people be killed or wounded, and then that was really it, up until the High Middle Ages when the, the sizes of armies started to ramp up. Because during, for example, the early Middle Ages and the Viking Age, armies rarely exceeded more than a couple thousand soldiers, especially in late Anglo-Saxon England. You hear all of these stories of battles between the, the Norse and the English and these, you know, great victories and whatnot, but you were only looking at armies of two to 5,000 soldiers on either side. You know, it just wasn't common to have huge battles up until the, the later medieval period when you started to see a change from swords, axes, and spears to pike formations and heavy cavalry and uh, the English use of the longbow as a primary weapon fantastic overview and something i wanted to <laughs> ask you um i didn't want to stop you because it, uh, it was so interesting to hear all that is how heavy were swords and axes so a sword um could range from three to seven pounds you even had swords that were a little over two pounds so yeah. and part of the reasoning for this was that a sword as it was fashioned in the medieval period was not uh, I mean, this is one thing that Game of Thrones drives me crazy with. Uh, they they cast the swords in the show. They, they pour the molten metal into a mold and then sharpen it. That's not how swords were made. That's going to be heavier. That is going to be much heavier than the way an actual sword is made, which is where it's it's forged. It's hammered. So you take steel, you heat it up, and then you hammer it into shape. Oh, literally, not you, don't you? What? You fold over the steel, don't you? Yeah, there's, there's, so you fold it a few times, you hammer it, you fold it, you hammer it until you get something that is very, very strong. It's not brittle, has a little bit of give to it, but it's much lighter, it's much stronger, and it holds a sh an edge much better than the, the cast swords you see in, for example, Game of Thrones um, and, and a lot of later movies. So swords would have been, um, I mean, the, a heavier sword would have been maybe seven or eight pounds. Uh, your average would have been three to five. And so that's much easier to, to swing around for a long period of time. It's also a much more agile weapon, whereas a uh, an axe 
could would be on the heavier side, you'd probably look at seven to ten pounds because the the idea behind the axe was that it was going to be heavy. It was going to gain momentum as it swung. It was sharp too, but that wasn't really the goal. So you know, you'd you'd be looking at, and also you got to remember, axes serve two functions. They could be used as a construction weapon or a construction tool to you know chop down trees and hammer things using the back of the axe, or you could use them in combat. That that's another reason they were more common than swords. You yeah. couldn't a sword has one function. It is a pure weapon. There's nothing else to use a sword for. It's too big to be used as a knife. It's too small to be used as an axe. It is only for combat. Whereas an axe has multiple uses. And while a spear is certainly not a utility tool, it's a much simpler weapon to craft. So you didn't really have to consider the 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 expense with it. And that's why a lot of lower rank soldiers uh you know would would be using an axe rather than a sword because it was much less expensive it was much easier to replace much cheaper to repair and uh the one of my favorite little tidbits about history is that uh the vikings the the geniuses that they were they were some of the best uh smiths and smelters in europe if not the best and they would export their weapons but what they did was they would take their their best weapons and keep them for themselves and then they would take the lower quality weapons made with lower quality iron lower quality steel and those were the ones they would sell so that if they ended up fighting somebody who had a weapon forged by a norseman it would almost definitely be of lower quality than their own <laughs> so yeah you could get great viking weapons but they were still not as good as the ones being used by the vikings themselves yeah i was gonna ask you about one weapon in particular this is my bit of favorites it's called a bill hook what do you think of bill hooks the bill hook is probably it's one of the most interesting because it exists almost purely out of spite. <laughs> um, because the entire point was to give you a weapon that could be used as a, a slashing or a stabbing weapon, basically as a, a halberd. But more importantly, the reason that hook was there that that wasn't there to kill the knight. You know, the reason that they had the hook was to pull the knight off the horse so that they could disarm the knight and take them back behind the lines to sell them off as a a hostage, to to hold them for ransom. Because in medieval armies, even if you were the lowliest of peasants, if you you captured that knight, you got the ransom money. Yeah. So bill hooks were, yes, they were obviously deadly weapons, but the goal was to take that bill hook and pull somebody off their horse. So to kind of work it into, into the fantasy writing aspect of things, if you're if you're writing about a world where soldiers are paid professionally, you don't want to use bill hooks. Don't put yeah. bill hooks in your story because it doesn't make sense. Use pikes. If if you have professional soldiers who are being paid and they don't get a portion of the ransom, if that's not part of your story, if that's not part of the function, don't use bill hooks because bill hooks were created for the purpose of taking people for ransom. Similarly, uh, you know, if you're if you're writing about um a mainly archery focused uh, culture, such as many of the elves in Lord of the Rings focus on archery and they're, they're good swordsmen as well, but they, they focus on the bow as their main weapon. So if you're going to be going with that, you don't want to have, you know, all of your, all of your characters from that, that side of things wearing like heavy chain mail armor and, and plate. If you don't like one of the things, one of my pet peeves is archers in movies and, and books who are also heavily armored, like the archers, uh, the Gondorian archers in Lord of the Rings, when you see the battle of uh, the Palomar <laughs> Fields and everything. What, your archers, first of all, should have nothing below the shoulder on their arms because they want the most freedom, the most range of motion for the arm, as yeah. well as the least amount of weight. So you want to make sure that you're, if, you're, if you have them wearing a cuirass, you, you want to make sure that it, leaves enough room for range of motion of the arms it, it doesn't it, so yeah leather armor sure a steel cuirass sure uh but don't give them plate or chain mail on their arms it doesn't make any sense uh just like how if you have um a, a cavalry focused kingdom in your in your story like for example uh rohan from lord of the rings that, that's gonna be my archetype you can use lord of the rings it's one of the best uh yeah well one of the most fleshed out you don't want to have them riding around without armor on the, on their 
their cavalry. You don't want to give them like leather armor or like segmentata or something like that. You want to give them chain mail and plate <laughs> because what they've got to be able to do is survive being hit in the chest by a spear. You want to make it so that weapons glance off of them. Yeah. Because that's that's the way that worked. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to give them like leather armor that's really not going to do much if they charge directly onto a pike. One thing I wanted to ask you as well very quickly is about farm weapons. So these are like weapons that originated on farms. So like flails. Flails um, are fake. A flail is fake. I just wanted to ask you because I've seen them a few times in fantasy. I've, I've read about them in a few history books as well. So I just wanted to get your take on yeah. these sorts of deadlyish weapons that originate from farms. Yeah. So flails, we have them, right? We they existed, but we have no reliable sources, or very few reliable sources, I should say, that really show them uh, and discuss them being used in combat. Because when you think when you think about what it is as a weapon, it, it's very unwieldy. You, you've got to, like, not only do you have to swing it at somebody, but you also have to, like, wind up for your swing. A sword you can slash, an axe you can slash, a mace you can slash, a flail you've got to wind up and swing it. So it might make sense if you're, you know, running a flanking maneuver, but in terms of having the most effective, efficient weaponry, it just doesn't make sense on a battlefield. Now, in a tournament, you might see them, because there you're not really thinking about tactics quite as much, but we don't, we don't believe that flails were used extensively, and certainly not in the early or high medieval period. It would have been a later medieval weapon. And then as for you know farming implements, uh, especially in the early medieval period, you would have seen sides and pitchforks and hoes and uh, you know uh, sea axe knives, like things like that would have been extremely common on the battlefield because the majority of your army was made up of peasants who were you know essentially there to add a body behind your professional soldiers. Uh, for example, in the Anglo-Saxon. Uh, fighting style, you would have your shield wall, which would be made up of your various earls and um, thanes and their their household guards, their retainers. Uh, what, what would later become thought of as kind of like men-at-arms. And they would make up your, your first two or three lines, and then behind them, you would just have all your peasants. And they would basically be there to just brace. Um, the goal was not for them to fight. You didn't want your uh, your third in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. You didn't want them fighting. You wanted them to be there as a body to basically staunch the the opposition's advance. And then if all else failed, you wanted to be able to rely on them to fill a gap. Yeah. But you did not want them to be the main force that was fighting, partially because they just weren't going to be good at it. You know, a, a pitchfork was not going to do much against somebody wearing chain mail and having a large round shield and a sword just wasn't going to do much. Um, but also if you lost that, if, if your line broke and the enemy came through and cut down half your, half the peasants in your army, you just lost a lot of farmers and you're going to now be facing a lot of economic consequences from the defeat. So they were there more as a, a reserve and a, a last ditch effort than they were ever meant to be fighting somebody. So they would be coming in with sides and hoes and, you know, hatchets and things like that. That it was incredibly common to see a farming implement on a battlefield. And we've seen this, we, we have seen battlefields, especially in England and Ireland, where you had a, a very nice, very well-made sword laying there in the dirt next to a pitchfork made out of wood. So we, we know that these were used in combat. Aiden. That's fascinating chat again there about medieval history and the joys of it and the, obviously the, the darker side with the weapons and stuff like that. But it's always interesting and loads of ideas percolating there, especially that one at the end where you say the sword uh, far next to the pitchfork. That's a story in itself. Oh, yeah. You can, yeah, you can take that, that and, one. and write yourself a whole, uh, a whole background for that. Yeah. Aiden, how can we find out a bit more about you? Uh, you can find me on pretty much all social media at the Aiden Mattis. That's T H E A I D A N M A T T I S. Or you can find me on YouTube and Patreon at the Lore Lodge. Thanks very much, Aiden. We'll be back in uh, next episode with a look at food in the medieval period. All right, thanks all right. very much. Yeah, thank you.
A big thank you to Mr. Matters for sharing his insights on the blade, the weapons that we see in the fantasy genre. I hope you've learned something new. and I hope you've also found some inspiration for your own fantasy tales. I learned a lot about different types of weapons that I could use in stories or give to different kinds of characters. So one of the things that I took away from my chat with Aiden was about the bill hook. And I used Bill Hooks in Pariah's Lament, my novel. And to hear Aiden's um, insights about how it was used by poorer um, soldiers and, and warriors to capture and ransom knights and, and nobles and people like that. I found that really interesting. So it gave me lots of ideas for stories. And I've already started working on a short story off the back of it. I hope you get the same benefits as I have. If you're looking for more guidance and support, you can check out our Patreon page. There you can get access to writing classes and workshops, all focused on the fantasy genre. There's so far, you can um, watch how to write a fantasy novel, how to create fantasy characters, uh, how to build a fantasy world as well. And you can also get a copy of my book on writing fantasy, A Fantasy Writer's Handbook, which is available to buy on Amazon too. Don't forget, you could also join our writing group where you can find hundreds of passionate and like-minded writers all willing to help you out with your work. You can find beta readers, get advice and feedback, keep in the loop with the latest writing news and calls for submissions. And you can also share your writing news and achievements too your personal achievements, something that we love to hear more than anything else. And that brings us to the end of this episode. It feels weird ending it here, but I do think it's going to uh, work for a lot more people. So if you do prefer these shorter episodes, please write in, let me know. And um, if you prefer the, the longer ones, then I want to know that as well. So what I'll probably do, if if people like both, I'll do a blend of the two. And if you did enjoy today's episode, please consider following or subscribing uh, to the show. Leave us a rating on Spotify or a review on iTunes and share it with anyone you think may enjoy it. We'll be back on the 14th of April with an interesting look at the influence of Dungeons and Dragons on the fantasy genre, which is a game I've never played, but I've always wanted to try. So... If you have any comments or questions about Dungeons and Dragons, I know a lot of people out there play it, or any topics generally to do with writing or the fantasy genre and writing fantasy, if you'd like us to cover anything in particular on the show, please email in at thefantasywriterstoolshed at gmail.com. Thank you again for listening and keep on scribbling. Mm -hmm.